So today on Life Lessons, we're Life Lessons with Linda Clay. And Linda has just got an abundance of life lessons to share with us. And we're really excited because we've been having a chat to Linda for a while and um, really want to bring forward some of the key events in Linda's life to try and share them with you today. And what we're going to talk about today with Linda is the fact that um, 20 years ago, Linda has what she calls the WTF year, um, which is when she really sadly lost her husband, Bruce. So we're going to go back to that year and really understand what happened, what happened after that, because it was a pretty tumultuous time, wasn't it, Linda? Welcome. Yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And yes, Good. it was definitely a WTF year. It was so a real be, wake you, up call. You'd be married from the age of 20, yeah? So you, you right. were together a long time, but this was, you know, you weren't old when this happened. So just talk us through, take us back to that point in time. Sure. And just a background, I was married at 20. Mm -hmm. And we had two daughters. We had a great marriage. Um, so when he, um, actually when he got sick, I was 48 and he was 49. Mm -hmm. And um, I was in the best career I had ever had and was, you know, just loving life. Mm -hmm. And he just, um, it started that year with being diagnosed with diabetes. And then um, he just kept not feeling well. So we kept going back to the doctor saying, what's wrong? What's wrong? And they just kept saying it was his diabetes. And there was one spot in his lower back that he kept complaining about. And it would actually swell and then it would go away. And then it would swell and it would go away. And when it swelled, it hurt more. And so finally, <clears throat> I was on a business trip in uh, New York. And when I got back, my daughter picked me up. And she said, mom, I had to take dad to the emergency room because he was in so much pain. And this was like totally out of the blue. And so it was like, okay. And she goes, but he's okay now. And I said, great. You know, what did they say? What's wrong? And they said, no, they couldn't find anything. So I get back into the swing of life, you know, from the business trip and all that. And all of a sudden his pain increased again. And so I rushed him. I took him again to like an urgent care clinic and they couldn't find anything wrong. So they sent us to the emergency room again and his pain, if you were to do level, you know, one to 10, how doctors do his was at a nine, 10. I mean, it was really painful. Mm. So they referred us to a doctor um, and we started going to the doctor and they started doing all these tests and they couldn't find out what was wrong. And so finally, and this probably went on for over two weeks, two and a half weeks or something, all these different tests. And they finally say, we're going to do one more blood test, but it's going to take several weeks to get the results because we have to send it to a different um, lab in California. So for, if you haven't experienced something like that, it's like you're, you start to become in a surreal, um, it's almost like you're out of body experience in a way because right. You know something's going on. Of course, you don't want to admit something is going on that could be serious. And so you kind of go on autopilot and you do those daily things. You take care of all that. And so we finally got a call and the doctor said, please come in. And so we can go over the results. And so we come in. And as soon as he said the words oncologist, I knew that there was something more mm. than just, you know, something like diabetes. And um, and then he said, what hospital do you want to go to? You can go to this hospital or that hospital. And I just went, are you saying that he's going to end up in the hospital? And he goes, yeah, he will. Mm -hmm. And so, but he wouldn't tell me what kind of cancer or anything like that. So he referred us to the oncologist and the oncologist told us he had what is called multimyeloma, which is a blood cancer that gets inside your bone. So it's in your marrow. Um, it's one of the most painful cancers. So that would explain the increase in his cancer. So, you know, fine. He starts radiation. They um, do an MRI and they find that the cancer has spread halfway up his spine. So we were told that he, A, it takes five to 10 years for this type of cancer to really show up. So it's inside your bones for that long. And then we were told he had two to five years. So what does your mind do? Your mind goes normally to, okay, two to five years, I can prepare for this. 
I can get ready. You know, we can do the things that we've always talked about doing, you know, we'll just have this beautiful life and of what's left of it. And so, but he didn't get better. And they gave him chemo with a pill and he was in the hospital for that because they weren't sure how it would react. And then um, they sent him home and then they gave him another chemo treatment and he still wasn't getting better. In fact, he was losing weight and they couldn't figure out why was he losing weight because the cancer only showed up in his bone marrow, nowhere else in his body. So um, he finally, I guess it was after um, July 4th here, and we had a bunch of my daughter's friends. My husband was a um, kind of like the good shepherd in the Bible. I mean, he took care of all these young kids when they were in high school. My daughters would bring them home, and he was their pal, and he mentored them and all that. And so after July 4th, I get a call from my daughter saying, mom, you got to come home because there's something wrong with dad. And so I get home and his feet had swollen like elephantitis and the skin was starting to break. Oh, wow. And so, you know, water was seeping out. So we took him to the doctor <clears throat> and the doctor just said, Bruce, you've got to go back in the hospital. We've got to figure out what's going on. And so he was there. I stayed with him. And while I was going through all this, my, my boss at my beloved career, what I was doing started to kind of undermine me at work. He was telling people to do things because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. What I didn't know is that he wanted a store for his girlfriend. And um, so you've got that, I should be at work, guilt, trip. Yeah. And yet you're knowing something's going on and, and you don't know how to handle it. You don't know how to react to it. And so finally, he kept complaining of his stomach area. So finally, the nurse practitioner came in and ordered a CAT scan. And what they found was that he had cancer, but it wasn't metastasized. It was a different kind of cancer when they did the biopsy. So he had actually had two kinds of cancer. Mm. And, you know, if I close my eyes now, today, I can see the doctor sitting across from us telling us that there's nothing they can do. Mm. And that is probably one of the hardest things to take in and to understand and to work through in your head because of course you always have hope and i did i mean it was cancer people get cured from cancer all the time or put in remission or whatever and it was going to be okay well are you know, what, what were you what went through your head can you remember um oh god i don't know i i just know that i was like stunned I was like frozen in time, maybe is a good way of putting it. Mm -hmm. And I just remember following the doctor out after he told Bruce and I. Um, and I said, so you're, he's dying. And the doctor said, yes. And I said, well, I don't want him here. I want to bring him home. Mm -hmm. So the doctor released him and we took him home. And that's where it really became more of a surreal event. Mm -hmm because you know somebody is dying, but you don't know when, mm -hmm. you don't know what the process is gonna be. And because he wasn't diagnosed terminal at that time, because mm -hmm. they didn't have the official diagnosis for the second cancer yet, um, I couldn't get hospice care. I was gonna say, did you have somebody helping you? No, I did it myself. Mm -hmm. I changed the IVs. I took care of his ulcerated sore. I sat with him all day. Wow. You know, I did everything that I could. Um, and I mean, I remember the first time I did the IV and I did it wrong. Yeah. And so blood squirting out everywhere. And I'm like in this yeah. horrific panic of, oh my God. And thank God the hospice nurse was a beautiful human being. And she said, just call me if anything mm -hmm. happens. And she said, I'm not supposed to, but I will help yeah. you through it. Mm -hmm. And so she, I called her, she helped me fix the IV and stuff like that. But um, yeah, it was pretty, it was pretty traumatic mm -hmm. and it went on, I want to say for about 10 days, mm -hmm. he came home and 10 days later he was gone. Mm -hmm. So the time frame went from two to five years of life to four months, mm -hmm. basically from the time he was diagnosed till when he died. And, um, you know, I just remember my heart ache, you know, if you ever hear, you know, a breaking heart, they do break. Mm -hmm. and um 
I just kept remember telling him, you know, it's okay, you can go because I knew he was in pain. He was on morphine, you know, and he just said, no, it's not time yet. Mm -hmm. But he would sit and rock on his bed and it was like he was waiting for somebody. So, and I really think he was waiting for his grandmother who he had, who he had adored um, to come and take him, mm -hmm. you know, away. I mm -hmm. firmly believe that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, but it did come to the point, to be honest, that <clears throat> I had to make a decision because the, the pain was so bad. Mm -hmm. And so um, I called the hospice nurse and she said, you know, if I do this, if I up his prescription or his, mm -hmm. I don't know, not prescription, but the amount, um, he'll just go to sleep. And I said, that, yeah. that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know? yeah. So that right there was like the start of that year. So I had that process to go through. I knew my job was kind of in jeopardy in a way. Um, two weeks after my husband died, my oldest daughter tried to commit suicide and I found her. Um, like, and as sweet, a, like as a mom, like my little boy's only five. Like I, I can't imagine. <laughs> I, I mean, losing your husband must be so traumatic, but seeing your child in a self-inflicted state, clearly she wasn't, very well emotionally and mentally mm -hmm. at that time to do something like that because you you know but had there been any signs Linda like what 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 did you do well her you know as I mentioned to you guys earlier she uh, my oldest daughter um, has um, battled drug addiction and alcoholism since she was 14 mm -hmm. so she um, does have a lot of mental challenges that she has to face Mm -hmm. And she, um, part of it is that she's, part of her mental illness is that she's very self-centered, very narcissistic in a way that things should evolve around her. So the attention from all the attention that had been given to her dad, I mean, it, she just wanted it put on herself right. and, um, that's been part of her pattern her entire life. So she took some of his medicine that we hadn't gotten rid of yet and uh, went to sleep she went to you know they took her to the hospital they put her in the 10-day program or whatever it is yeah. that they do um but she her pattern of behavior has always been to get better for a while and then slide back get better for a while and slide back mm -hmm. so after discovering that and then i had to go back to work because i was only given two weeks of leave and then I asked, I got a doctor to give me another week. So I had three weeks off. I go back in. I'm reeling for my husband. I'm reeling for my daughter. Yeah. And I have to walk into my store. I was a store manager of a multi-million dollar store. And it was Christmas time. You know, retail starts Christmas in August. Yeah, yeah. It's just a frenzy. Right. And so, and I had to go away for a while to a, uh, what I want to say, a business meeting or, you know, was, here's the Christmas, this is what we're going to do, you know, that kind of stuff. And of course you have to put on a happy face. You've got to put on like you want to be there. You've got 150 employees, you're motivating and coaching and doing all these things. Meanwhile, inside, I was literally torn apart because I didn't have time to mourn. Mm -hmm. And now I'll tell people, God, embrace that. Embrace your grief. Yeah. Because if you don't embrace it, it comes back and bites you in the ass. Well, yeah, the grief is, I know people don't like going through it, but the grief, and Cheryl just lost her dad in May. So it's like, oh. the grief is there. It's a process for a reason, right? right? It exists for a reason. It is to help you mourn for that person and, and move on. You're never going right. to forget them, but you're, you're so right. The people who we know in life who just kind of Avoid put it, it off, Avoid try it. and go around mm -hmm. it, it mm -hmm. just hits them bigger and harder. Right down the line yeah. but as a mom you know you're only in your 40s when this is going on you've got two children clearly one of your children is really needing is crying out for more help and that's just difficult for you to deal with no matter what the circumstances but with all of that it's weird isn't it how it's almost like you shouldn't have to worry about the mundane things like jobs. I think there's a line in PSI Love You where she doesn't want to leave the house and her friend says to her, you know, um, you know, you, you, like you work in class, basically, you can't afford, you can't afford to mourn all the rest of your life. You've got to go to work right. and that's life. You, at some point, this has to stop. Mm -hmm. so, but you must almost feel guilty about thinking about work because you must be thinking, well, I should be thinking about my husband who just died or my daughter, but I feel guilty because I'm thinking about bills and money and work. 
Mm-hmm. And you're and you're right. There's a process of grief is is guilt, it's anger, it's acceptance. It's there's all of these emotions, and society has conditioned us not to face those emotions. Mm-hmm. Society says, "Oh my God, you get a whole week off after you know." In here in America, if your parent dies, you only get three days. Wow! In lo- a lot of companies, how can you possibly literally, you know, face what you're facing? No. You're you know, not even out of the shock first. Oh yeah, in three days. Very few yeah. people would be. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so all of that happened. I, I kept making it through. I got through Christmas and then my mom was diagnosed with breast cancer, um, stage four. Um, and so that was another whammy, you know, and so it just was like this accumulation of different things that in the end I had to kick my oldest daughter out because her behavior had gone off Again, she had a two-year-old or two-and-a-half-year-old daughter mm. that I just looked at her and said, I'll just keep your daughter, <laughs> Kelsey, because I can't, you know, I don't know what other choice to do. And she goes, well, I can take her. And I go, and what, lock her in a room when you're partying all weekend? Mm. You can't do that. That's not going to work. Mm. So I took on being a single parent again for my granddaughter. And then one day, to be honest, I woke up and I couldn't stop crying. Mm. Right. And so all of everything that I had gone through that year just all of a sudden compiled into this. It's time out time. Yeah. So was so, that rock bottom? Do you think, Linda? Was that was yeah. that the pit moment for you when it was just like this is it? Um, it when I took well, yeah, when with my daughter when I had to ask her to leave because yeah. her yeah that really because there were some other things that happened that year, mm. um, but that was the br- straw that broke the camel's back basically. Yeah. And um, so I went on medical leave mm-hmm. and for, um, and here in the States, you get two years for depression because I was diagnosed with um, major clinical depression and PTSD, which mm-hmm. was brought on by the different traumatic events. Mm-hmm. People have a misunderstanding about PTSD. It can be any traumatic event. You don't have to be a soldier. Yeah. So That's- anything can actually you know trigger that. And so... Um, in all honesty, I sat there. I didn't want to come out of depression. Mm-hmm. You know, even though depression is an, it can be viewed as a negative thing, it also can be a comfort thing because you're in this like dark hole. Mm-hmm. There might be a little bit of light there, but you're in this dark hole and it's kind of warm, even though it's cold, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. But you're protected. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have to be hurt anymore. If I didn't live a life or if I wasn't really living, I was existing, yeah. then I don't have to put myself out there and be hurt. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. um, and so, um, and I laugh about it now, not joking about depression, but j- laughing because sometimes the universe just likes to say, you know, punch you in the gut and say, okay, enough's enough. Yeah. And I had reached a point where in the States you have to, um, when you're on a medical, you know, a disability plan with your company, you also have to apply for social security disability. And so I did that process, very demoralizing, even though I'd paid in it for years, it was, you know, it's like, they make you feel like you're a criminal. It's mm-hmm. awful. Yeah. Um, but they denied me, went through this whole process. Um, I had all this, you know, all my doctors are saying, no, she shouldn't work. No, she shouldn't work. And social security decided I could, and I could work at McDonald's. Oh. So it was like, that's one of the most stressful jobs. I mean, who would, you know, you don't know, you don't really have to think, but you got all those people yeah. staring at you. How, you know, I said, okay, whatever. <laughs> but, it's not like a job that you can just kind of get on with quietly, not no, be bothered no, as you bring yourself exactly. back yeah. into being around people. Because I don't know about you, I suffered from depression when I was younger and I just couldn't function. Like, I didn't want to be seen. I didn't right, to right. Can yeah. you imagine working in a McDonald's with all these people wanting their Big Macs? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in 15 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds like yeah. a sensible <laughs> approach. Yeah. <laughs> so I sat, th- I mean, that was the first thing I get the letter and I went, what? Mm-hmm. And I went, okay. So my brain's trying to start working now and it's going like this. And then I realized I was losing, I had no income. Mm. Okay. Because my social security or not my, not my social, my disability had run out or would be running out within, you know, okay. and they have a house payment. Mm-hmm. I can't make the house payment. 
Mm -hmm. So I put the house, I talk to the mortgage company and do what they call a deed in lieu of foreclosure because that's supposed to be better for your credit. And then I realized, wait a minute, now what am I going to do? You know, I have my granddaughters living with me. I'm raising her. Mm -hmm. I have this child I'm responsible for. Mm -hmm. And um, so I finally had to call my family and I had to fess up to some of my poor decisions, which actually in, an, in the end prompted me to, to get moving forward again. Mm -hmm. So it was like the universe came down and just said, okay, Linda, enough is enough. You have too much to give. You've got to get out of this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he, so, I know you're saying the poor decisions, but it's really difficult to make really great decisions when you're in the grip of something like depression, right. where there's just like a fog permanently in your right. head that you're trying to find your way through every day to function. So, yeah. you know, that, that's tough. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. I um, went and lived with my brother for a while. He offered me and his family a place to stay so I could, while well, I found a job. So um, I stayed with him for maybe a month, but I, I got my, I want to say my grip back. And I just said, okay, if this is what I have to do, I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. So I sat down every single day. I sent out, I don't know how many resumes with, you know, change the cover letters, change the resume to fit the job. Mm -hmm. And within a month I had a job. Fabulous. And my brother was going like, wow, I didn't think you, I thought you'd be here longer, mm -hmm. you know? And so I took that job and it was with a retail company, one, a type of retail I'd never been in before, but you know, what the hell? Mm -hmm. And so I take it, I move to a different state. So I was in Washington. I moved to a different state. The job um, was okay, but the area was not something that was where I permanently wanted to stay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I contact my old district manager for the other, my other company and sent her my resume. She sent it out to a bunch of district managers and I interviewed for a job way on the other, on the East coast in New Hampshire. Oh, wow. And I got the job. So here I am still healing from my husband's death mm -hmm. with a, see, Kelsey was probably five and a half, six mm -hmm. years old. We move across country mm -hmm. by ourselves. I have a friend help me, but I drive a U-Haul across the United States to the <laughs> East Coast. <laughs> and I start this job. I knew no one. I absolutely knew no one. And um, it was a great, it was a great job, great store that I finally managed, great people. And I realized one day going to work, I went, oh, like light bulb city, how sometimes the events that we go through in our life are actually meant for them to happen so that you can make a realization. Mm -hmm. So here I'm driving to work and I go, oh my God, I actually am a great store manager. What happened to me before, after my husband's death mm -hmm. had nothing to do with my management abilities. It had to do with a person. Yeah, and I yeah. laughed and I said, oh my God, you drove me all across, made me move across country just to make that one realization. Uh -huh. was <laughs> yeah. It was a turning point. And so I realized that I was in the book business and it was Barnes and Noble. And so you're working really late at night. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find decent daycare for my granddaughter. So half the time she came to the store with me and would play, she'd read, she's a fantastic reader now, but she'd, <laughs> she'd stay in the children's department and just read books all day long. Mm -hmm. But it worked at that time. And so. There are worse uh, places. You might yeah. still do McDonald's yeah. and the bed oh, yeah. had a very different it's experience. <laughs> she, she's, to, to this day, she's just really still upset because I would not let her attend the Harry Potter there was a book that was being released. Oh, I don't remember oh. which one. And she wanted so bad to go to the Harry Potter, you know, party that we were going to have for the release. And I said, no, it's too late at night. Can't do that. You know, that kind of thing. So she still goes, you wouldn't let me go, you know, but it was fun. <laughs> but I realized that I wanted to do something different. I wanted to raise her out of a retail environment because that, what, what, that is what I was in the whole time my daughters were growing up. So she had gone to a Waldorf school for a while and I just loved their philosophy and I loved how they let kids play and not, you know, be like tied to, you know, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So I want to be a school administrator for a Waldorf school. I've never done that. So I sat, got a big, huge piece of paper 
And then I laid it on my kitchen counter in the apartment we were living in. And I put, um, I wanted to go back to Seattle. So I put pictures of Seattle, like the Space Needle, the evergreen trees, the ferry boats. And I wrote all over it, school administrator at a Walder school, place for Kelsey, you know, all this all over. So every single day I could see it in the morning. I could see it when I got home from work and I would see it when I went to bed, before I went to bed. Within a short period of time, maybe two months or so, I had got her, um, a, uh, got her a scholarship for Walter School in the Seattle area. I had um, saved enough money. I found a U-Haul that would come in and pack up my stuff <laughs> and move it across country. And I, and like I said, I saved up enough money to live on for a while mm -hmm. um, before I found a job because I was going to, I quit my job. Yeah. So back in the car, we go. We <laughs> back in the car we yeah. Somebody else is taking my stuff, but it's just Kelsey and I driving clear across the country. So we get to Seattle. Um, we're staying with my youngest daughter and her husband. And so I start taking Kelsey to the water school every day. Well, it was like a 45 minute to an hour drive from where we were living. It was like, wow, I don't want to just turn around, go back and then drive back. That's crazy. So I started volunteering, mm -hmm. you know, like, why not? I'm here. I might as well help out. Okay. So I do that. And then they come and they ask me if I want to um, go part time, you know, <laughs> not, not big money. But I said, sure, why not? I'm here. I might as well, you know, I mean, get a little bit of money out of it. Right. So within a, I don't know, I want to say two months maybe or something, they hired me full time. <laughs> and then within a year after that, they um, promoted me in a sense to general manager, which is really like a school administrator. So it was exactly what I had put on that map. You board it out. Yeah. yeah, just the steps, you know, taken. And, and I think the thing that when I look back at all that and I look back at where I was after that WTF year, and the steps that I took, I mean, when I went to the school, they put me on a project. Well, the project was building or overseeing a parking lot rebuild, mm -hmm. a million dollar job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, I've never done this. Mm -hmm. And they go, oh no, don't worry about it. You can do it. Well, that involved getting to know city officials that got know about permitting about drainage, you know, working with construction dudes, you know, and all this kind of stuff. And I did it. Yeah. And so, you know, now when I work with people, it's like, no, you can do this, but let's just talk about it. How yeah. do we break it down? What kind of steps do we take? Yeah. And, yeah. So after that, um, I really started healing. Healing never stops. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't ever stop hurting. It's just that it's easier to handle, yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. you know, and then something will trigger it. And then all of a sudden you're back in that, that spot, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it, well, it's a, like you said that process, it's not like you get to that day on that month of that year yes. and you're done. You, you're healed. It could be yeah. a smell or a piece of uh -huh. music or right. a, like right. you're right back in that moment, right back right. at the time, but yeah. you recover from it a little bit faster. Sometimes, yeah. you know, it's, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, um, it's like, it gets kind of, I think, um, I'm very much into under, you know, now understanding how our reactions and everything are built into like in our muscles there, it's a muscle memory, they call it. Mm -hmm. And so things that, that happen today, your reaction can actually be based from something that happened in childhood yeah, because yeah. that was how you reacted and that you did it enough that it's just like cemented itself into your muscles. Yeah. So it's that retraining. But with grief, um, I think it just becomes a part of you. So like I was driving a couple of weeks ago and I don't even know why, but all of a sudden I just, oh my God, I miss you. And I started crying, you know, and so that, and that's okay. Yeah. You know, it's okay to admit that there's that lack in your life, that hole, that hole will never really be filled. Yeah. Your yeah. memories will help fill it. Yeah. The love that you had will help, you know, fill it but it's still there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But your life grows around the hole. It doesn't, right. grow it. it kind of makes the whole part of who you are, doesn't it? Right. So, right. Yeah. 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 So what would be then your, what's the thing you want to pay forward to the guys listening to Dale and who might be going through 
the loss of a loved one, an illness or a tough time with a child. And we're going to, we've said this, we're going to come back and do a different chapter with you because there are so many other things we could talk about. From, from the life lesson, from those experiences and those life events, what's the kind of overall life lesson you want to share with anyone listening today? I think that, they, that people need to understand that it's okay to grieve. I think that, you know, it's like I always tell people grief is like an ocean wave. So it'll recede out there and then it'll come crashing in on you. Mm. Either part of that is okay. So just embrace it. You know, one of the best moments that I, um, through that whole process that I can remember that actually cleared my body in a sense was the day I, I was still working. So my husband, um, I think my husband had died, but I was so angry mm. because that's it. It's like, why? All these other sh shitty people out there, why mm -hmm. did it have to be my, you know, you go through that. It's that, well, why me kind of thing. And um, now I just say, well, why not me? Mm -hmm. You know, obviously, you know, I meant to be here for some reason and share something, right? Yeah. So I went out to my car on lunch one day and nobody was in the parking lot, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> and I get in my car and I hold onto my steering wheel and I am literally hitting it and screaming at the top of my lungs mm -hmm. but by actually letting myself feel that anger helped me get through yeah yeah and when you're dealing with depression when you're dealing with grief when you're dealing with anything so traumatic like that don't think about the whole picture mm -hmm. just think about i only need to get through this amount of time whatever that time is for you. So I only need to get through the next 10 minutes. That's what I told myself when I was depressed. Mm -hmm. When I was so bad off, it was like, I only need to get through these next 15 yeah. minutes and then yeah. it would be the half hour and then it would be the hour. Yeah. Do the same thing with grief. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. allow yourself to be you and express it the best in the way you can. Don't hold it in. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. It's hard. It, it is hard and we, we when we're coaching people we say this all the time it's like feel the feelings and with something yep. like grief it's so important that you do because like we said earlier it's it's healthy otherwise it'll just come back at you yeah. and mm -hmm. it, like we, we were talking about this before, there's this culture now almost like where you try to avoid and sideswerve anything that's too messy or too disruptive or too upsetting and it's like it is what it is right so go through it and feel it and, and I love that that it's really like like an ocean wave it's it sort of it comes and goes and right right that is but one step in front of the other yeah right and I think that's it's true on anything that you're going through so like going through grief is really a it's a great learning experience because it also teaches you about yourself yeah and so many people have a lack of self-love I mean really allowing themselves to love themselves and so by looking at something, some, you know, huge experience that you're going through and honoring yourself in that process, that's what it amounts to, right? Mm -hmm. That you're honoring yourself to allow yourself to just get through the next 20 minutes, yeah. honoring yourself to, oh God, I can remember going to get my hair cut and feeling so guilty. And this is when my husband was in the hospital yeah. and it was like, God, I shouldn't leave him. I shouldn't leave him. But then it was like, but I need my haircut. I need my haircut, you know? Yeah. And so I went and so for that time frame of getting my hair cut gave me a chance to get away from the pain mm -hmm. for the hour I was gone. You know, my, when he came home, my um, Garth Brooks was in Seattle mm -hmm. and my youngest daughter absolutely adores Garth mm -hmm. Brooks. And so we got some tickets and we talked my brother and then this young man that my husband had basically saved his life came over to sit with Bruce that night and we went. And so for those, you feel that guilt because it's like, no, you know what's going on logically. You know, you should be there, but emotionally you got to take breaks. Yeah. You yeah. You have to take breaks. Yeah. And so going for that three hours and listening to Garth sing all his songs and we could sing them along and you know, all this stuff was probably one of the best things that I did in that yeah. because it allowed me to get away from it all yeah and and it's okay to be present isn't it with because the, the kids needed that as well so right yeah yeah well, wow linda we we'll yeah. definitely will have to come back guys for another kind <laughs> of other events in linda's life that we haven't even 
really nice <laughs> so they may be another chapter a part two of linda clear's story awesome, point. awesome. happy so, to come back yeah thank you so much for sharing you. such oh, really you're welcome. intense events with us and um hopefully somebody listening today will take something from that thank yeah. you linda thank you you're thank welcome you. thank you for having me <laughs>